Today, I would like to go through some of the proposed constitutional changes that will be brought about by the BBI report. Now, since we have been asked to read before we give our opinions, I chose to look at uh, the general overview of what will be affected by the report in the Constitution. Now, the proposed changes will affect at least 14 chapters of the 2010 Constitution. Starting with Chapter 2, which uh, speaks on the formative aspects of the Republic, the changes will address regional integration, cohesion, shared prosperity, and put a centrality on the economy. Uh, the report argues that this will be to harness regional trade, investment, and people to people links to increase opportunities for investment and enhance security. Then there is the chapter three, which speaks about citizenship. The changes aim to strengthen the national ethos by outlining the responsibilities of the citizens. The amendment is informed by the understanding that the current constitution as it is has rightly imposed various socio-economic duties to the, on the state but does not envision any responsibilities on the part of the citizen. So the changes will outline very uh, specific and also general responsibilities of you as a citizen then the chapter four, which has the Bill of Rights, uh, will provide a constitutional underpinning for the privacy of citizens' personal data as an emerging area in human rights, owing to significant technological developments on this area. So those of us who had concerns about the security of the data collected by Huduma number. Uh, these changes on this area aim to take care of that. On chapter six, which is about leadership and integrity, the changes aim to intensify the, the fight against corruption by strengthening relevant institutions. This includes providing a mechanism for more expeditious conduct of investigation, prosecution, and trial of corruption-related matters. Chapter 7 will also be affected. On Chapter 7 is representation of the people. And uh, the document aims to resolve, the changes aims to resolve issues on divisive elections arising from the electoral process. The proposed amendments seek to enhance transparency, fairness, and representation in the electoral system. They also aim to reform the management structure of the IEBC. I think if you remember the 2010 elections also did a similar thing because after the um,
the national unity government that um, had President Kibaki share power with Honorable Raila Odinga. Uh, ECK, the election commission of Kenya was disbanded and it was scrapped and in its place was the interim electoral commission. I think it was IEEC, which after the new 2010 constitution, um, the IEBC now, the Independent Elections and Boundaries Commission was formed. So I don't know, this will be the third time that uh, this body will go major changes. Now, I don't know what will happen if the opponent, of course, the person who has lost the election, and many times it will be a person with many followers around the country. I don't know how it will take care of if someone rejects the results and asks um, his or her followers to come out into the streets. I don't know how that now will be handled. Now, in the same representation, it is seeks to promote gender equity in governance by actualizing the constitution, no, the constitutional provision of the two-thirds gender rule on the elective and appointive office. Yeah, um, the document actually proposes to senators elected in each county and uh, the center the uh, the, the two sen um, senators will come from either gender so instead of uh, the 47 senators we will have double and also some more um, some more appointed senators that are proposed by these changes. So that seems to take care of gender parity, although again, looking at it, it bloats or makes the Senate now, the, 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 the members of the Senate uh, will be more than double. It will also, it also, the changes also seek to implement provisions of Article 81D and 89, sub Article 7D of the Constitution, which mandates the electoral system to comply with the universal principles of fair representation, equality of the vote, and requirement that IEBC in certain constituency and ward boundaries should progressively work to, uh, to ensure the number of inhabitants of each constituency and ward is as near as possible to the equal population quota. This also seeks to stem a practice called in the US as gerrymandering. Um, it came about after a governor, I think in, it's in the uh, 17 or 1800s, who could change the constituencies in such a way that um, if you are his opponent, then the boundaries would be changed in such a way that your supporters are divided without the respect of the population and the needs of the population. The changes were, changed, were made in such a way that uh, even some of the constituencies would have uh, funny shapes resembling a samaranda. So this kind of um, interference came to be known as gerrymandering. Um, something that the BBI, as we are told, seeks to address.
On chapter 8 that deals with the legislature, it is to undertake the following, to remodel the parliamentary system by bringing the government back into the house, including, now this is where the big debate is, that there, it is seeks to create a post of the prime minister, deputy prime ministers, which uh, opposes two <laughs> deputy prime ministers, uh, uh, to be in the in, in parliament. I mean, after they already, of course, after these posts are created in the next chapter that I'm going to read. Cabinet ministers also will be in parliament, the attorney general, the leader of the opposition, being the person who was the runner-up in the presidential election. So um, then chapter 9, which is now the main um, contentious, uh, the main um, um, issue that is very contentious, chapter 9 is, uh, is on executive. And here it is said that by expanding the national executive, in order to promote greater inclusivity and mitigate the drawbacks of the winner takes it all electoral formula. So it recommends therefore and proposes introduction of the office of the prime minister and two deputy prime ministers. Uh, this looks like um, the arrangement we had after the post-election violence, remember we had a prime minister who happened to be right honorable Raila Ondinga and two deputies who happened to be Salia Mudavadi and uh, our current president Uhuru Kenyatta. It also provides that the cabinet ministers be appointed from members of the National Assembly. So the proposes that um, members or MPs can now be appointed to the cabinet while they keep their parliamentary seats, but also insists that those members will have one salary. So they won't um, claim the salary of a minister as well as the salary of a member of parliament uh, but of course we would expect that there will be allowances for the added responsibilities now some have argued that including the office of the prime minister two deputy prime ministers and um, leader of official opposition will not make a lot of difference in the executive because they are only you know, one, two, three, four people who also have a salary because they are members of parliament. But again, you remember, an office of prime minister does not carry the prime minister alone. He has his own secretariat. He has his own, you know, all manner of security and people who serve in his office. The same goes to the deputy prime minister. The same goes to the office of the official opposition so it holds no water to say that it will not <laughs> affect the executive budget in fact it will affect the executive budget the overheads will go up because the prime minister will not sit in his office alone he will need maybe a secretary or two or five he will need under security security vehicles maybe an official residence, a physical office to be constructed or set aside for him. The same goes to the deputy uh, prime uh, ministers who will also need their own staff working for them and all, also physical offices, uh, vehicles, security, and all that goes with it. They will have a, a new, there will be a new communication uh, budget for them. There will be a new traveling budget for them so it comes with all as a package it does not come as an individual so it is good to understand that there is a chapter 10 on 
the constitution that speaks about the judiciary that will be affected by these changes we were told we go through. Um, it seeks to enhance the judicial accountability to the people of Kenya. This means that while the independence of the judi judiciary must be protected as a fundamental principle, the fundamental principle is the principle of um, the three arms of government, separation of power, judiciary, legislature, and uh, the executive. Uh, so they have to be dependent so that they can check each other. The judiciary should equally be accountable in a clear manner to the sovereign will of the people. <laughs> Here, probably, when you speak about the sovereign will, you remember that uh, the Supreme Court, led by Justice Maraga, nullified the win of President Uhuru Kenyatta in 2017. And some may see this as a time has come to fix <laughs> the Supreme Court or to fix the Chief Justice, I don't know. But again, now this is what the changes will include. It therefore proposed the introduction of the independent office of the judiciary of a Buddhist who shall sit in the Judicial Service Commission, the JSC. Chapter 11, which is on the devolved government, proposes the following changes. Creating of a county world development fund to be gover governed by statute. Now this seems to mirror the CDF, or the, county, the, the Constituency Development Fund that was introduced by President Moi Kibaki when he came into power and also adopted by the new constitution of 2010, uh, which, uh, whose aim was to bring the development closer to the people into their constituencies. Now these changes envision the same thing happening into the world. Um, it also seeks to increase resources to the counties from the current 15% of the national budget to at least 35%, which uh, seems to be a good win for the counties. And uh, maybe probably it may also promote much more development in the grassroots with more money going to the county. It also seeks to focus on service delivery in settled and serviced areas, including um, people living near the farthest boundary of each county. It also seeks to abide and monitor, implement, and impact assessment of Article 43 in the rights in the President's State of Nation address in the budgeting process, ensure greater inclusivity, fairness, equity, accountability in distribution of resources. And uh, there is also a part where it proposes that 50% of the funds allocated to the county, five sorry, five percent, be locked to a certain develop uh, to development that is beneficial to the people. Um, mostly, the count the, the country countries have been spending all their money on recurrent expenditure, leaving no money at all for development. Now. These changes propose that a certain percent, percentage, specifically five percent, be locked to be used for only one purpose. At least five percent must be used for development. Maybe uh, probably it, it can go higher, but at least five. Mm, that looks a bit low to me, uh, but we don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's a good start. Chapter 12 is on public finance, which seeks to streamline public finance principles and processes 
to promote efficiency and ensure expenditure is directly is directed to maximizing utility it also proposes to give special attention to actualization of the rights guaranteed under article 43 as well as strengthening devolution there are also chapters 13 14 and 15 affected which addresses public service national security agencies and commissions independent offices are strengthened and it also speaks to make these offices that is the uh, national security agencies public service i think national security agencies uh, include the pol police uh, and all that the, maybe the uniformed forces to make account them accountable to the people of kenya have internal accountability systems that clearly and transparently separate the power of appointment and promotion from that of interdiction and censure carry out rigorous audits that inquire into value for money and ensure that sound principles of public finance management apply to every arm of government and every public institution also to facilitate promote and enable ethical conduct and responsibility in public resource resources management now i think this is one of which seeks to stem corruption then there's chapter 16 which is on general provisions it seeks to define new define new terms introduced by other proposed amendments third schedule on national oaths and affirmations to make promotion for the oaths to be administered in respect of state officers for whom such requirements had been omitted probably in the correct one of things so these are highlights and um, i hope that um, we will be able to go through the whole BBI report, reading chapter by chapter and looking at the areas of interest. Now you can, the BBI report is available on soft copy. I will post a link under the description of this video so that you can be able also to find time and read through the document and when the time comes to give our recommendations probably you will be able to have something to present so i'll give a link which links you to where you can actually download on your phone or on your computer the soft copy of the bbi report that's it for today thank you for listening I would also wish to ask you to please like the video and also subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much. Enjoy your reading.